Welcome to Act in Line, the podcast of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, producer and host. This week, we're going to be diving back into history for a bit to explore the work of Abraham Kuyper. Kuyper was a Dutch politician and Reformed theologian during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. During his career, he wrote many books about theology, politics, culture, and so much more, and he continues to influence many theologians today. Kuyper's writings are important to Acton because he helps us understand the role that Christians are called to play in every area of life, especially those in the public square, like politics and even economics. On this episode, Michael Wagenman joins the show to talk about his new book, Engaging the World with Abraham Kuyper. Michael is a professor of theology at Western University and a professor of biblical interpretation at Redeemer University College in Hamilton, Ontario. Also, Acton has worked with Lexham Press and the Abraham Kuyper Translation Society for the past several years to put out a collection of Kuyper's writings. And if you want to learn more about Kuyper, these volumes are a great place to start. You can purchase them through Acton's online bookshop, and I'll include that link in our show notes at blog.acton.org. That's blog.acton, A-C-T-O-N dot O-R-G. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Wagenman, the author of the new book, Engaging the World with Abraham Kuyper from Lexham Press. Michael, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. It really is my pleasure. I want to ask you first, who was Abraham Kuyper? I know many of our listeners will already be familiar with Kuyper because the Acton Institute puts out a lot of publications and has held events in the past to do with Abraham Kuyper, but he is a somewhat, I would say, obscure figure in history. So can you just give us a little bit of a brief biography? Who was Abraham Kuyper? Yeah, of course. I, there are probably three different ways that you could answer that question, and they all stem from what you've just mentioned. Um, Different groups of people know him in different ways. So, you know, on the one hand, Abraham Kuyper was a late 19th century, very early 20th century Dutch Christian. A second way to answer that would be to say that he was a profoundly influential Christian. During his lifetime, he held a number of positions within society and was very public as a Christian, especially as Dutch society was changing. And we might get into all of the different roles that he played, uh, but he, he got to be known in a wide variety of ways by a lot of people. And it was because of that, thirdly, I would say, that Abraham Kuyper functions as kind of a, a launching off of a, of a bit of a new tradition uh, within Christianity, especially Protestant Christianity, where the vision, the, the vision of the Christian faith is that Jesus Christ is Lord over everything. Abraham Kuyper didn't see a kind of sacred secular split Uh, to the world. He saw the entire world, what we might call sacred and what we might call secular, the entire world was under the Lordship of Christ. And this has profound implications and ramifications for many different areas of life. And so the kind of person that he was, was to kind of launch a new tradition. We sometimes call it the Kuyperian tradition or the Neo-Calvinist tradition, and it's this tradition that has uh, really brought Kuyper's name much farther than, you know, if he was just a pastor in the Netherlands in the 19th century. Now, you say that central to his to his ideas was the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord of all, that he is, um, he's the head of all these spheres of life. So I want to unpack that a little bit more because I know I'm, you know, even for myself and for, um, many of my listeners, I know they'll be thinking, many of them are Christians. They'll be thinking, well, that's a fairly simple statement. Of course, Jesus is Lord of all. Um, but the way that Kuiper addressed this idea and the way that he applied it 
to how the church approaches everything from culture to politics, he saw that as being um, really inherent and important in that approach. So can you unpack that a little bit more? Why was the way that Abraham Kuyper thought about Jesus's lordship? In what ways did it introduce new ideas to the church's role in the public sphere? Yeah. So, you know, typically there are Christians who see Jesus as Lord of their individual lives. And that is true, but oftentimes uh, it's kind of limited to that. But then there are others and other Christian traditions who see Jesus as Lord over the church or, or maybe uh, over kind of the religious domain of life. And of course, that's true as well. Jesus is Lord of the church. He's the head of the body. Um, but what Kuiper was able to discern within Scripture and within the Christian theological tradition is what we might call a kind of social theology, or a a, a theology of culture and society. And Kuiper was able to identify that within life, there are a range of organizations and institutions that are between the individual and the state. And those sometimes are referred to as civil society, there are churches and schools and businesses and you know humanitarian organizations and things like this and and what Kuiper was able to do is he was able to discern that with, within civil society there are these identifiable groupings what he called them spheres of human activity and that these spheres are distinct from each other so for example a church is distinct from a business, or uh, uh, an art guild is different from a school. And so what he was able to do is he was able to, first of all, identify these various spheres, and it's, it's a little bit debated how many spheres he identified or how many spheres there are, but most people reflecting on this can pretty easily recognize that, yeah, there's things called businesses, and they're very different from things called, you know, sport clubs. And in all of these different spheres, Jesus is Lord there as well. Jesus isn't just Lord of the individual. Jesus isn't just Lord of the church, but Jesus is also Lord of business and education and public media, and and all kinds of different activities. And then what he was able to do on top of that is he was able to build on identifying these spheres and reflect on what makes each sphere unique and, and what is it about that sphere that when it's functioning properly, it contributes to healthy human culture and society the way God would, in, would intend it to be. So that is, that is kind of the genius of, of Kuiper in this regard. One of the things that I learned about Kuiper when I was reading your book that I hadn't known to begin with was that I think in part the catalyst for Kuiper coming up with this here he called sphere sovereignty idea was identifying early on that the church had a tendency to either insulate itself from culture or water down the gospel so that it is more attractive to modern culture. Um, and I think that we see the church doing that today in large parts too. So, I mean, Kuiper's really, when his approach to sphere sovereignty and how um, the church approaches these different spheres um, is comparable to Kuiper's time, there's a lot of similarities. Yeah, we could really talk a lot about the sphere of the church uh, that that Kuiper also himself spent a lot of time talking about. During Kuiper's lifetime, you know, he lived in the midst of a significant cultural and societal changes in the Netherlands, really across Europe. And now in North America, we're also today experiencing many of these changes. And 
a lot of times Christians will ask the question, you know, what does this mean for the church, therefore? What is the church's role in society generally? And, and what is the church's role in society when society or the culture is changing? And Kuiper had um, an idea that kind of grew out of sphere sovereignty. So he thought that the church was a sphere within civil society, just like other spheres. And like you kind of alluded to, the church, when it's in the midst of society, it, it is tempted to shift as well. And, you know, we can think back to maybe kind of medieval Christianity, where the church really was the center of society. And sometimes the church was uh, working with the state or, you know, with the king uh, to, to run society. But there is this tendency for the church to kind of monopolize all of life. And Kuiper was very much against that. He felt that the church had a specific role to play, but it was not the role of running everything. And, of course, the flip tendency or temptation is also possible, and you know, you've mentioned it, that the church in the midst of society, especially when society is changing, is tempted to withdraw from society, to kind of, you might say, circle the wagons and, and create a, a defensive and kind of bunker-like relationship with society. And again, Kuiper was very much opposed to that as well. So Kuiper had this idea when it came to the church and its its sphere and its relationship with society, that the church had kind of, I call it a bimodal existence. It, it existed in two modes. The one mode is the gathered mode. This is the kind of mode that you would see on a Sunday morning when people assemble for worship in a congregation. And that is the one mode. The other mode is the mode of the church when those Christians leave the worship service and are sent. They go out into the world and they live their Christian lives. They become Christian witnesses in the whole of life. And so this is how Kuiper was able to kind of wrestle with, does the church have a direct or an indirect relationship to the world? And maybe even the state specifically. So when the church is in its gathered mode, it does not have a direct relationship with the state. It exists as a gathered worshiping community to hear God's word, to be shaped in Christ likeness, to serve each other, and to be equipped to be sent out into the world as individual Christians and Christian organizations. And it's in that mode, when the church is sent out into the world as individuals and organizations, that the church in that mode has its direct influence in society. This would be when, you know, Christians leave church and go back to work as a politician, or they leave church and they go back to work as a business person, or they, you know, they leave church and they go back to work as a doctor or a homemaker that's where then Christians have a direct relationship with society and culture. There's a line in your book, you write that Kuiper brought the full weight of a Christian worldview to critique and challenge the new modernist worldview. What are the hallmarks of this modernist worldview? Right. So modernism is a kind of a philosophical, intellectual, and, and even political movement that had been gaining steam really for centuries, uh, right about the time of the Protestant Reformation. Some of these I ideas that became the Enlightenment worldview uh, were already starting to show up. And really, um, others have written much more about this, but the Enlightenment worldview is a view that says the scientific method, science, and we could say even philosophy, these are the means by which we can discover what is true about the world. And that's very much opposed to a Christian worldview that would say it's in Scripture that we find the truth about the world. And so that, that, that's kind of a, a key instance. And what this meant during Kuiper's life was that the state 
the Dutch state, or we could just even talk about the state in general, was giving in to this kind of same temptation that the church faces, and that is the state was starting to run and rule over everything, to the point that even the state uh, attempted to dictate what people would believe and really have its hands in all of the spheres of civil society. And this is where Kuiper's work of holding up the the lordship of Christ in the various spheres of society was his attempt to say no to this, this kind of overreaching power of the state. The state has its place. It is the referee of justice for society, but it does not have the right to force the spheres of civil society to function according to its whims. So that's kind of how Kuiper's sphere sovereignty wasn't just descriptive of how society should function, but Kuiper also used it you know, as a way of deploying a kind of break or resistance against the modernist vision of the state being in control of everything. Kuiper, as you said at the beginning, was a politician, so he was familiar with wrestling with these separations and distinctions and probably thought a lot, I mean, he did think a lot about how he, as a Christian, should participate in politics. Um, One of the things I learned from your book that I I didn't already know also was that Kuiper did not call himself a conservative, but he was also not a liberal. He agreed with the conservatives as far as his anti-liberal opinions went, but rather he called himself an anti-revolutionary and even established the anti-revolutionary party. Why did he see himself as an anti-revolutionary? What did that mean to him? Yeah, of course. Kuiper was living uh, during the time when the ideals of the French Revolution were in the air, where the Enlightenment worldview seemed to lead people to believe that if you saw something wrong in the world, let's say society was not organized in a proper way, that this gave one the right to engage in revolution. That is, wholesale um, turning over of society, much like what happened in the French Revolution. And Kuiper was very much opposed to this idea. He thought that it was uh, very destructive to human society, and it, it ran the risk of not respecting the human dignity of the people involved in the process. And so what Kuiper believed was the way Christians should operate and, and, and really encourage others as well, is that rather than revolution, which introduces a sharp break in history, uh, the approach should be reformation. That, of course, there are things that at times we identify are wrong with society or our culture or institutions. But that is our opportunity, Kuiper would say, to get involved, to get involved and organically in history, bring about the reformations that are needed to bring an institution more in line with what is healthy or what is God-ordained, and the same with the state. And so as Kuiper lived during his lifetime, he did many things before he was prime minister. He was a pastor, he worked in the media, he started a a university, he started a a political party, he started a, a labor organization, he did many things where he was able to see what was happening, not only in society, but in the state. And he very quickly discerned that the state was going, the Dutch state was going down the path of revolution, that an ideology had taken hold within the state and was going to be destructive. And so he wanted to make a clear stand against the ideals of revolution And that's why his party is called the Anti-Revolutionary Party, uh, because we have to take the world as it is and work with it to reform it rather than just bulldoze and in our pride think that we can build something new from scratch that'll be perfect. 
I'm still wondering exactly how Kuiper defined the separation of church and state. I know that we've touched on that briefly already, but for someone of faith like Kuiper, if you believe that the gospel touches on all spheres, where did he make separations? Yeah, so the main lines I've already hinted at a little bit. Let me make it explicit. The church and state are separate, first of all, because they're two separate spheres. God has ordained a role that the state plays and has ordained a role that the church plays. And the church is not the state and the state is not the church. We can't confuse them. We can't allow them to get intermingled in any kind of way. They have to remain distinct. That's the first thing. But like you say, the gospel isn't just for the church. It's for the world. So how does that work? So the way that... um, Kuiper worked that was by seeing the church as these two modes that I mentioned before. That yes, when the church gathers for official worship, its primary function in that mode is to worship God and to hear from God through his word. But then these Christians that are gathered in the church are equipped in such a way that when they leave the church, they don't leave their faith behind but they take their faith with them out into the world, into their various occupations and callings and neighborhoods and relationships. And it's in all of those relationships that Christians are called by God to let their faith shine and to let the insights from their faith permeate how they live their lives and the sorts of work that they do in society. And this is where, uh, in, a, in a democratic political process, you would have a Christian not, um, you know, e- expecting their church to make official proclamations to the government, but instead to take their faith and to, to allow their faith to speak through their political vocation as an, as an individual and maybe to kind of group together as a group of Christians within politics, let's say. So he, Kuiper does see that faith is relevant to all of life. Jesus has a comprehensive lordship. That means Christ is comprehensively relevant. But that the way that works itself out on a societal level means that the spheres, the institutions are distinct, but the people who are Christians are equipped by the church and sent into the world to bear witness to that to that lordship of Christ. Well, for those who believe that there is a God in a reigning objective truth, and for people who believe that every person around them is made in the image of God, when you approach everything from politics to your job and your home life, you see every person as heading toward an eternal destination. I, I think it was C.S. Lewis who said that you've never met a mere mortal How could that not affect what we do every day? Mm -hmm. And especially in a democratic process, uh, Christians should feel the weight of their responsibility to live and articulate the Christian faith in the most persuasive and winsome and attractive ways possible. Because in a democracy, the, the, the best ideas win. And this is where Kuiper would say, we as Christians, the church is there to equip us to do that work out in the world so that we are the most, you know, winsome uh, and attractive, you know, butcher and baker and politician and nurse and doctor uh, and even politician, so that through the work that we do, people will see and hear our faith and be drawn to it rather than repelled by it. Michael, if someone would like to start reading Kuiper, where should they start? Yeah, well, obviously my book is a, is a great introduction. That's why it was written to be kind of an introduction to who Kuiper was and what the main ideas of his life were. Um, then I would say if you want to read Kuiper himself, and of course you're going to be reading someone from a century ago, but he gave a series of lectures in North America They've been published, uh, the title is Lectures on Calvinism, and again, uh, he covers a variety of different spheres or or topics in life, and that would be a great way. And then uh, James Bratt 
has written a couple of books. One is a, a kind of biography of Kuiper, and another is a collection of a whole bunch of different speeches that Kuiper gave. And they're easily find, you can find them easily on Google or whatever. Uh, but if you really want to read Kuiper himself and be exposed to really his dynamic worldview, uh, those are some of the place, best places to start. Michael, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Oh, it's really been my pleasure. Thank you for asking. As always, thank you so much for listening today. Our podcast team loves putting the show together for you every week, and it's so encouraging to hear back from our listeners. Feedback is super important to me because it lets me know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most, and also how I can improve this show to make sure you're getting the most out of it. You can reach our team at actinline at actin.org, or you can call our office at 616 454 3080. And if you like our show, you know what to do. Leave us those ratings and reviews on the Apple Podcast app and subscribe. Act in Line is on YouTube, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. 